Good to be saved? Amen. Good to be in church? Amen. I didn't say nothing. I didn't say nothing. No. Amen. Hey, I will tell you this. Um, you know, I don't tell people what I preach. I just, uh, I don't, I've, had, I've been sitting on a platform with, a, with an outline in my hand and had the Lord tell me something else to preach. I, while the pastor's giving announcements, I turned the, turned the outline over, wrote a new sermon, and walked to the pulpit and preached it. So I don't tell people what I preach because I don't know exactly what I'm going to preach. <laughs> Even the Holy Spirit has a question on that one. And, um, but I talk about what I'm going to teach. And so I'm going to tell you what we're going to be talking about the next three nights. Tomorrow night, uh, we're going to talk about the, uh, the mystery form of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Matthew chapter 13. Remember, if you were there this morning, in chapter 10, he sent out his, his apostles saying, Preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Jews. Or don't go to the Samaritans. He, he offers himself in chapter 11 as the Messiah. He's rejected. In chapter 12, he says, go to the Gentiles. And in chapter 13, that's all those parables of the, of the uh, kingdom of heaven. And we're going to explain those parables. Uh, there's eight of them. And we're going to explain those tomorrow night because the kingdom had to stay around. So he turned it into, into mystery form. Uh, then uh, Tuesday night, we're going to look at one chapter of the book of Matthew that is the most... Uh, Troubling if you don't understand that Matthew is not for us. Now, let me just give you a thought, okay? But uh, this is not tonight's message, but go to Matthew chapter 19. Go to Matthew 19. If you have trouble finding it, it's after, just after 18. <clears throat> I was telling that so that Rose could help your pastor. Fine. Anyway, um, in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, that Philippian jailer comes to the apostle Paul and says, what must I do to be saved? He wants to get eternal life, correct? If somebody asked you, if they said to you, how do I get eternal life? What would you tell them? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved in the house. Look what, the, what Jesus Christ answered when that question was asked of him. Uh, look at verse um, 16, chapter 19, verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. I, I don't mean this bad, but I don't think you'd want to take him soul winning. You say, Well, wait a minute, is that true? Was well, then. Yeah, it was absolutely true for when he said that. And so, so <clears throat> we're going to explain uh, on. on um, uh, Monday night, we'll be explaining Matthew chapter 13 and the uh, Kingdom of Heaven parables. Uh, on Tuesday night, we'll be explaining Matthew chapter 24. Because if you don't understand that, if you don't understand a little bit of dispensationalism, that 24 isn't for us, you're going to find yourself going halfway through the tribulation. And then uh, on the last night, I am going to tell you truthfully how you can be perfect. Wait a second. These guys will find out they got, a, like, they got a flash of red light or something. Yeah, thank you. That's good. He had to, like, jump up and down. Um, anyway, yeah, um, Wednesday night, I'm going to tell you how you can be perfect. I'm telling you, you can be perfect. Now, let me ask you a question. Can you be sinlessly perfect? No, you cannot. Not here, but you can be perfect because God says he wants us to be perfect, and God does not expect us to do that which we cannot do, Correct. And so I'm going to tell you three ways uh, that you can be perfect. I bring myself as an example. But um, uh, anyway, so, uh, so that, is for, um, that is for Wednesday night. Uh, I want to talk to you about Matthew, so let's go to Luke. Uh, let's go to the Gospel of Luke. We looked at it this morning, Luke chapter 5. <clears throat> and um, now some of you guys have been married. You know, I joke, I joke about Lou and his daughter here. But... Um, I, uh, no, really. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's daughter. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, you know, I'm always joking with Lou about being old because he's so stinking old. He's really so old. But, um, and I'm sure they'll understand. If you've been saved any length of time, your pastor, uh, he was telling me, he said next year, next year he's going to be 40. Uh, believe me, we know that, <clears throat> and uh, his dad will be 70 from what I hear, but um, uh, I was in a church not too long ago, and a pastor came up to me, and he said, uh, for my wife this week. I said, sure, why? He said, she's depressed, and I said, why? He said, well, she's 
40 this week, and she's depressed about it. And I said, oh, I said, tell her not to worry. I said, uh, this week she'll turn 40, and I said, then just five years from now, she'll turn 50. And then two years after that, she'll turn 60. And a guy looked at me, you know, like, you can't do math? And I said, trust me. I can, it took me 40 years to get to 40. It took me 45 years to get to 50. That, between 40 and 50 could not have been a decade. And between 50 and 60, man, it was like a blink of the eye. You know, I, I tell people, you know, all these people, you know, life is a challenge. Yeah, like, can you get out of bed today? I said, my, my view of life is it is a polished granite wall at a 45 degree angle, and today's goal is just to hook a fingernail as I slide toward the abyss. And um, like it or not, every one of day, today, you will be one, clo one day closer to a hole in the ground than you were when you got up this morning. Isn't that nice and encouraging? But, uh, but that's true. And I, I said this to Kathy. Folks have been married for quite a while. Uh, we've been married 47 years. Next year will be 48. And um, probably, I said this somewhere around, you've got to be married about 30 years. I said, I said, babe, I said, we now realize. You know, you think, think sometimes um, big decisions are monumental when you make them. Uh, sometimes they seem like small decisions. And it's years before you realize that they're, they're monumental. And I told her this. I said, I said, babe, I said, we have reached the point in our life where 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we, we made it a, a decision that at the time did not seem monumental. But now I realize, had we made the wrong decision back there, we couldn't go back and change it. It's just too long, okay? And you look at people who have made some decisions. Some of them have been monumental. I think probably one of the uh, most famous in our semi, our time, uh, of a monumental decision was uh, Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was a professional baseball player. He's, he, was, uh, he was not just headed for uh, uh, stardom and wealth. He was probably headed for Cooperstown, uh, a place in the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, and he said, and one day he, he, was, he told all of his drinking buddies, he said, boys, I'm going to hit the sawdust trail. And became the, the uh, nation's leading evangelist. And as much as people talk about him winning a million people to the Lord, uh, he is the one that got every bar in the country shut down with Prohibition. And if you think Prohibition was bad, it's because you watch Hollywood's rendition of it every time. Okay? What I'm saying is, Billy Sunday is now with the Lord, right? All right, what if Billy Sunday could come down here and answer one question? That night you made that decision, not to get saved. He was already saved. He'd gotten saved. But the night he made that decision to, to leave the fame of baseball, and go out and preach for the Lord. Do you understand how the world looks at that? Like, Sunday, you're an idiot. Well, you think he might say, yeah, I, I should stay playing baseball. Or would he say, best decision ever made? You know, almost parallel to that, uh, I have a friend. Uh, his name, uh, always, all his life, he wanted to be a professional baseball player. His name was Bobby Bonner. And Bobby Bonner, <clears throat> uh, his, uh, Tremendous baseball skill, baseball talent. Ended up getting on the Rochester Red Wings, which was the farm team for the Baltimore Orioles, Rochester, New York. And Bobby Bonner got saved. Uh, and uh, he was playing for the Rochester Red Wings when he got called up to the, to the majors with another rookie. And the day that they called him up, it was all, everybody knew that these two guys were headed for Cooperstown. They were such talent. Uh, the, they, I saw a baseball card. And it had, it had on one side, it had Bobby Bonner, the year he was called up. And on the other side, it had the other guy. And um, anyway, uh, <laughs> Christmas is coming, guys. Did you know that? Uh, it, I was going to say it's Nolan Ryan, but it wasn't. It was, what's that, babe? Calvin. There you go. See why I keep her around? Anyway, um, it was Cal Ripken. And they said, these two guys are headed for the, for the Hall of Fame. Cal Ripken on one side, Bobby Bonner on the other. They said, well, I've heard of Cal Ripken. I haven't heard of Bobby Bonner. That's because Bobby Bonner lived his dream of being a professional baseball player for three years. And then God said this, I want you to leave baseball and go to Botswana, Africa as a missionary. Bobby said when he was cleaning out, all the team was standing around saying, Bobby, you're crazy. 
Bobby, you're, way, you're walking away from millions of dollars. Bobby, you're walking away from money you'll make on ads. Bobby, you're walking away from the fame that you'll have. Bobby, you're walking away from a place in Cooperstown. He walked away from all of it. I went to Botswana, Africa for 25 years, came back after 25 years, having had malaria so many times that his doctor finally told him, you get it one more time and you'll die. So he's now back in this country. He's running the mission board that, that was the board that uh, he worked through when he was there. And uh, one of these days, Bobby Bonner's going to die. But let me ask you a question. If we say, hey, Bob, uh, that decision you made, what do you think of that decision? Well, would, would you just stay playing ball or would you say, no, it's a good decision? And we're going to look at uh, this decision here. We looked at it this morning, and I am moved by this. I really am, guys. I am always moved by it. Uh, Luke chapter 5, verses 27 and 28, after these things, he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom and said unto him, follow me. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Father, it's good to be saved. Always good to be saved. God, it's always good to be in church. God bless these people who came to church tonight. There's probably somebody who just doesn't feel that good. Didn't feel like coming, almost didn't come. But they come for you. They didn't come for me, they came for you. Lord God, I pray that you'll bless every person just because they came. And then if you could, God, get Sam Gip out of your way and out of their way, that you might bless them uh, with something that is said from this pulpit tonight, uh, that they might be edified, that they being edified, they might live to your glory. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. So it says this, uh, verse 28, and he left all, rose up, and followed him. That is now a fact of history, correct? And the book of Matthew is a fact of history. Uh, and the fact that Matthew is dead is a fact of history. Um, if we could get Matthew to come in here right now and said, hey, remember that day you're standing in front of a table of money down at the marketplace? You understand how, you know how they made their money? The, the, the government would say, here's how much tax money we need from you, and he would just add to everybody's tax bill. That's how he made his own money. It was just, uh, he just, if, if the government wanted $500 from somebody, he said, the government wants $600 from you, and that's, he got the extra 100 that's how, he, that's how he paid himself. So he walked away from his entire income. And if we, if we ask Matthew, that decision you made to walk away from everything and follow Jesus Christ, was that a good decision? What would he tell us about that decision? That's what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. Uh, if he were here, what he would say. Uh, the first thing I think he would say is this. I really believe this. I think he would tell you that no cost is too great. Uh, if there's anything that stops people from serving Christ, it is not a, it's not a lack of love for Christ. There are people that love Christ. But then the Lord says, come away and serve me, and you'd be surprised how many people hook their fingernails into their job or into their, their comfort uh, or whatever it is. They hang on to it like a man in a, hanging on to a post in a hurricane because they just can't leave it, and they just never do anything. Um, my wife and I, I don't know how many times in the last uh, 40, 47 years, we have met preachers who had jobs. I, I can think of two particular guys, one guy, uh, two of them had jobs with the post office, and the post office had such good benefits. God called these guys to preach, and they answered. God wanted them to go to Bible college, and they went. God wanted, God wanted them to pastor, and they pastored. God wanted them to walk away from their job and be full-time pastors, and both of them balked. Both of them stopped. They could not make that cut of walking away from all of it and just trusting the Lord to take care of them. And I'm just, I am telling you guys, I am absolutely, I think this thing is, uh, this thing is monumental in history that this guy, the Lord, he didn't say, did he even say to them, to him what he said to, to, to Peter, James, and John, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men? They could at least have been saying, well, I don't know what that means, but this ought to be good. He didn't even give him that. Oh, uh, follow me and I'll make you a taxer of the whole world. <laughs> I mean, what would he have said to, to Levi? He just walks up to him and says, follow me. And that's what I'm telling you. If it was an American, he'd say, where to? How long? Right now? Oh, I can't do it. I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll, meet me back here in about two hours, and I'll do it. We would try to be reasonable. You know, I think one of the dumbest things Christians say, <clears throat> and they say it, it's not only that it's dumb, but they say it like they're <clears throat> And they say it like this. When God tells me to jump, I just say, how high and where to? 
That's somebody that's never going to do anything for God. Because they'll wait and wait and wait for years, waiting for God to tell them how high to jump and where to. If God wants you to jump, you know what he's going to say? Jump. You say, well, how high should I jump? Is it for God? Then I would think you'd jump, jump as high as you possibly could. Where to? Try straight up. Really, I figure, can't this be true? Look, he was uh, in, in Acts chapter 8. You've got Philip. He leads that Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord. Vaporizes. The Bible said he disappears and shows up 20 miles away. So I figure if God wants you to, you just, where do I jump? Jump straight up. And if God wants you to land someplace different, he can spin the world under you while you're in the air. Is that not true? And he walks up to this, this Jewish tax collector who is a rich man and says, follow me. And the guy doesn't even, remember the, remember the, the, the parable? Uh, Lord, I have, uh, I bought some land and I haven't seen it. I want to see the land first. Oh, uh, Lord, I've married a wife. Lord, I, I, no, there's no excuse at all. The guy just walks away from him and left all and followed him. We'd say, would that be, would that be, uh, would you do that again? No, I think he'd say, no cost is too great. It's all worth it. Don't you reckon at the, at the time the Lord was on, probably true today, but don't you reckon at the time the Lord was on the uh, earth, there were probably more rich tax collectors than there were fishermen? You know, I guess this was a TV program. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's still on. I've never seen a, an episode of it. As, as the world's most dangerous job. And the world's most dangerous job. I, I, I read a lot of, of, uh, of stories uh, for the Fight On books. <clears throat> And as I read everything as far as occupations, I don't care if it's coal mining and you're a mile under the earth, I, I establish that the most dangerous job on the planet is being a fisherman in the Bering Sea. And apparently somebody in Hollywood saw, read the same thing because uh, that's what they say, the world's most dangerous job is being a fisherman in, in, uh, in, the, in the Bering Sea. And um, those guys get paid good and die. They die. You know tax collectors? I mean, when's the last time you heard a tax collector, what, he, he broke his back trying to pick up the money? <laughs> so, so if you can find, they get paid good, but man, look at the job. And so there were more rich tax collectors than there were fishermen. He walked up to a cat tax collector and he said, follow me. Think about it. If you're a fisherman, you could say, I am tired of fighting the storms. I'm tired of the smell. I'm tired of going, walking home and having people, when I walk past them, say I smell like a fish. I'm walking away from all of this stuff. I just can't do this anymore. My, I'm getting older. My body can't handle this anymore. I'm going to follow him. Maybe whatever he's going to do has got to be easier. Not for Matthew. What's easier than, name again? Okay. And how much are you paying? It, no, no, no. Another hundred. Okay, okay, you're clear. Woo, I'll bet I had to sit down and kind of rest after that. I got winded. Man, I did some writing today. I did some high power writing. That's all he did. And then he ate. He must have been part Baptist. But guys, he walked away from all of it. Uh, you know what I, you know what, I, honest, you know what I think he'd say to some of us? What? You can't walk away from your possessions? You can't walk away from what you got? Did you ever wonder why they call them possessions? Maybe it's because they possess us. I was, uh, when I was in Bible college, my first year, you know, I got saved as a Roman Catholic. I got saved. Ten weeks later, I was in Bible college. And uh, that's quite an experience because you know absolutely nothing. And you show up, and, and even the terminology is strange. And people would talk about the call to preach and the call to the mission field. And, and, and I didn't understand that. And there was a guy that had just graduated, and he was, uh, he was on deputation, or about to start deputation, to be a missionary to, to Japan. And I said, uh, what is this call to preach? I understand it. What, what does that mean? So he gave me his own testimony, and he was saved uh, late in life. He had a wife and children. Uh, he wasn't saved like it as a child or as a teenager. Uh, and he was from Ohio, and he said, well, he said, uh, somebody invited me to go to this church. I had this evangelist preaching, and... Um, the Lord dealt with me at the invitation. The Lord dealt with me about getting saved. And he said, you know how you hear people saying, the Lord told me to go for the pew and fought the Holy Spirit? He said, I didn't. He said, I just stepped right out. I went forward and I got saved. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. And he said, uh, he said then I, uh, I went there for a while, <clears throat> and the Lord dealt with me about uh, the call to preach. 
And when he did, he said, he gave the invitation. He said, I just went forward and surrendered. I didn't fight God about nothing. I just got down my, on my knees and said, God, uh, I'll preach. And he said, um, I went down to Bible college, and he said there was a guy preaching, and he was a missionary, and he talked about uh, the call to the mission field. And the Lord said, I'll be a, he, said, I'll, he said, man, I walked up. I said, I'll be a missionary. I just, even though I was newly saved, I, I, was, I could tell this was kind of different because it's usually people when God tells them to do something. You know, you know, here's our standard prayer. Lord, what do you want me to do? Oh, uh, you, you, you got a second plan? <laughs> you got another option? And he said, then one day, he said, this guy was preaching, and God dealt with me to go to Japan as a missionary. And I said, so you went down and surrendered to go to Japan as a missionary? Huh? He goes, no. I said, no. He said, no. He said, here's what I told God. He said, I told God, God, when you dealt with me about going to Bible, uh, getting saved, I didn't fight you. I didn't resist you. I went and got saved. He said, well, you dealt with me about preaching. I didn't fight you or, or, or anything. And he said, I, just, I said, I'd be a preacher. When you dealt with me about being a missionary, I told you I'd be a missionary. I never fought you. He said, but I'm not going to Japan. He said, I'm not taking my wife and my children halfway around the world to a people who look different than me, who speak different than me, who eat different than me, whose culture is different than ours. He said, I'll be a missionary somewhere. I'll preach for it. But he said, I'm not going to Japan. But when I'm talking to him, he's going to Japan. And, and I said this. I didn't even know that this was a Christian term. I said, so somewhere, I said, you got right with God, right? He said, yeah. I said, who is preaching the day you got right with God? He said, nobody. He said, I got right with God about going to Japan the day I had my family in our family car. And he said, I drove our car into the side of a moving freight train. Now, you've heard of cars getting hit by trains. How many times did you hear a train getting hit by a car? I mean, how do you not see a freight train? Probably because he was looking over his shoulder looking for God, chasing him. He said, I can still hear the, the, the sound of that car being crushed under the wheels of that train. I could still hear the screams of my family. See, what I didn't tell you is that if he was here today, he'd have come to the pulpit like this. And everybody in his family has got some kind of spine problems and, and, and head trauma. And he said, he said, I'm laying alongside the railroad tracks. We're waiting for the ambulance. And he said, I saw somebody pick up the lifeless body of my two-year-old son, lay it on the hood of my car, and I heard him say to somebody, he's dead. And he said, I bowed my head alongside those railroad tracks and said, God, I'll be a missionary to Japan. That's a tough way to, get it, to finally get it straightened out with God. But you know what I'll bet you if he's here today? He'd say it's the best decision ever made. I don't think any, any cost is too great. When I, uh, when I got saved, I was painting cars. I love painting cars. I still enjoy it. I, I don't do it, but I still, I still enjoy it. And um, all I ever wanted was my own. I actually went, I went to my body shop, my own body shop. But actually, I went to my own paint shop. And I was just starting to get into custom paints uh, at the time I got saved. Uh, when I went down to Bible college 10 weeks after I got saved, I still had long hair, see-through body shirts, bell bottoms, open-toed sandals, and I pulled in a red, white, and blue Volkswagen. In fact, in fact. I showed that to you or not. That's what it looked like. <laughs> and I painted it. The blue was metal flake. The red was candy apple red. It had a white spider webbing. It was just, uh, it was just made, made basically a, a, a learning lesson uh, on, uh, on custom paints. And I got saved, and the uh, Lord called me to go to Bible college. So I, went, I left the shop, and I went down to Bible college. I came back my second year. Uh, after the first year, I came back my, my first summer. I'm sorry. And now summer is over. I'm ready to go back down to my second year of college. <clears throat> and I told the boss, it was just me and him. It was his shop, and, and I worked for him. It was just a two-man shop. And I said, well, Rod, I said, I'm going down to Bible college. I said, well, I'll come back next summer and preach for you, or, or work for you. And he goes, no, you won't. I said, why not? He said, I'm, I'm selling the whole place and moving to Texas. I said, who are you selling it to? He said, I'm selling it to you for uh, $7,000. Guys, there were probably $15,000 worth of of, of automotive, uh, mechanical, and, and body shop tools. The whole place was a piece of ground, a three-bedroom house, the shop, all the tools, even the name. He said, I'm going to lock the door, hand you the key, and go to Texas. You say, man, that was, a, that was a steal. More than a steal, guys, it was what? It was my dream. It was all I ever wanted to do. It took me about five seconds. I said, uh, no, Rod, not me. God's called me to preach. So, so, and you say, oh, do you re regret that? No, no. 30 years ago, 30, 33 years ago, when we went on the road, uh, I sold all my body shop tools, 
And even when I tell you that, it hurts me, even though they don't even use the stuff that I had anymore. But um, you say, well, do you regret it? Nope, nope, nope. I wouldn't ra I'd rather do this than, than, than eat. Now, that's a Baptist statement. <laughs> but I'm telling you, if you think about this, if you could sit Matt down and say, Matthew, what were you doing the day the Lord called you? Ah, you know, I was uh, standing there in the, the, the city square. I was collecting taxes like I did every day. And uh, I saw him enter the square. He always had this crowd around him. I mean, he had the, the apostles, a few guys, a couple of fishermen followed him. But then there were always people around him. I heard about him. And then he kind of looked right across the square at me. And I'm telling you, when his eyes hit my eyes, they spoke to me. And I knew, I knew he was coming to me. And he walked up to me, and he just said, follow me. And I've heard people speak in authority. And his voice was quiet. It wasn't demanding. But it had more authority in it than anything I've ever heard in my life. And he just looked at me and said, follow me. And he said, it wasn't even a decision. I didn't even look at the table and think, well, i got to do something with this. I just thought, i got to get behind him as quick as I can. I am telling you, if you said to him, wow, you walked away from your total income. You walked away from a table full of money. You ended your future. Do you understand they had no retirement? He was going to live on whatever he could, he could get from the people. And he walked away from all of it. You say, was, you think, was that worth it? He said, oh, man, I'd do it, I'd do it if I had twice the amount of money so if set aside. I'd, if I had twice the amount of money on the table, if I had the other tax collector saying, don't go, don't go, don't go, he said, I am telling you, there is no cost too great. Walk away from anything for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the first thing I think he'd tell us is, there's no cost too great. The second thing I think he would tell us is uh, what I, something I referred to this morning, and that is this. He walks away from all this and then ends up not being the first stringer. When the Lord calls the three guys to the Mount of Transfiguration, he looks at him and he says, there's Matthew, and he's going, oh, he's going to say something great. He goes, uh, Pete, James, John, come with me. <laughs> How do you think he felt? How do you think the other apostles felt when they came down telling them what it was like to be on the Mount of Transfiguration? What it was like to see Moses and Elijah show up and hear God speak? This is my beloved son, hear ye him. Do you think they were, I bet they were talking about that. And Matt wasn't chosen. You know what I think he would tell us? Don't feel slighted if you're not a star. You know, uh, we've got this thing where everybody's got to be a star. Uh, everybody has got this, uh, <clears throat> this thing that they're, they're, they're like, like, I am worthy of something. I, I was listening to a uh, Fox News report, and they were interviewing a child psychologist. And they were talking to him about Generation Y, which I thought Generation X was bad, but Generation Y is the like Generation X with their brains beat out. And um, he said they're the most inept generation we have. He said they can't do anything. Uh, they all end up living in their mother's basements. Uh, he said that um, if the computer goes down, they're totally helpless, totally helpless. And this is what he said but they have the highest esteem of any generation in history. You know what this means? That these guys can't do anything, and they're proud of it. And he said this, and I couldn't believe it. He said, and they all believe, this is the, he said they all believe. This guy that talks to him professionally, he said, and they all believe that someday there's going to be a, uh, a reality TV program about their life. And, and I thought when he, I heard that, I thought, oh, there was already. There, there was a, 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 any of you remember... Oh, this is going to be, this is going to date you. Um, this, you know, of course, you remember when TV came into being. But um, do you remember when there were only three stations and they went off the air at 11 o'clock and a test pattern came up and it went, ooh. I thought, that was it. <laughs> That's the reality TV program about their life. I mean, people who have done nothing think ever, you, you don't think that's true? Look at what they tell you on Facebook. I took a picture of the fried eggs I had for breakfast. Oh, man, that made my day seeing your fried eggs. I mean, how, you know. I mean, they think everybody wants to know what they're doing. Isn't that true? Hey, guys, everybody wants to be a star. Nobody wants to be just a guy on the line. You know, I used to play sandlot football. I never played anything on a school. I was too small. But I like to play on the line. And I never, you know, you know this thing about, I want to be the most valuable player. You know what I want to be? A valuable player. 
I didn't have to be the most valuable player. I just wanted to get online and stop a guy from coming through the line. And I'd line up against, I'd line up against this one guy <clears throat> that he played, he played semi-pro football. Nobody would line up across from him except stupid me. And, and, the, and they'd snap the ball, and I'd hit him as hard as I could. And I think one day he just decided, I think I'll just unwind once. Man, we came off the line, and he moved aside, and a truck came through behind him. And he hit me so hard that after the play, they're, they're forming the lineup, and I'm walking behind, I'm, I'm walking around like this, and I'm going, don't go down, you'll never get up. Don't go down. He comes over, he goes, you all right? I'm all right, I'm all right. Yeah. What's my name again? Yeah, okay, okay. And then lined up across from him again. And either I was totally numb or he was merciful. I think the latter. Because he could have put me in the grave on the next hit. But you know what Matt said? Don't, hey, look, you're not going to get up in front of the crowd. You're not going to be the one that is the star. You're not going to be the one that they talk about. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about not being a star. Uh, you know, one of the things that I was telling you this morning, if you, if you stop and think about this, all right? Peter, James, and John, the big three, correct? In one book, the Gospel of Matthew, he wrote more than Peter and James combined. Those guys wrote books. They wrote more books than him, but combined, the two epistles of, of Peter and James, they don't add up to the book of Matthew. In one book, he outwrote them. And I told you again this morning, no book explains the kingdom of heaven, the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, like the book of Matthew. In the kingdom of heaven, if you remember every time you read in Matthew, the kingdom of heaven, that's a literal, physical, visible kingdom, what we would call now the millennium. And when you see the kingdom of God, that is talking about when you trust Jesus Christ, and you are in the kingdom of God now. The kingdom of heaven is not here. It will be here someday when Jesus Christ comes back to this earth. But the kingdom of heaven is not here. You didn't, you didn't, uh, you didn't submit yourself to the kingdom of heaven. You submitted yourself to the kingdom of God. And there is no book. Think about this. If he had not, if he had not done that. Um, I was talking to our sister back here, our, Mike, your wife. And, and she said this morning after Sunday school, she said, did you say it, it helped you? It helped you see some things? That's what she said. <laughs> Get her out of here. She's lying now. But anyway, no, what I'm saying is that, that Matthew unlocks the key from the Old Testament to the New, like no one else ever did. That book. And he said, okay. So when he wanted the big three, I didn't get to go. And I, and I can't tell you what it was like to be on the Mount Transfiguration. And, and I didn't pillow my head on his bosom at the Last Supper. And he never said, do this or do that. And I don't have any great quotes, but I wrote a book, and that book has helped more people. It has helped more people. And... and um, I think he'd say, don't worry about be, not being a star. Uh, I see people all the time, young people, young people, if they can't be the star. You know one of the problems with Sandlot football is if you got 11 guys, 10 of them want to be the quarterback. They all want to be the quarterback. They all want to be the guy that's, they all think they're going to be a star. Everybody wants to be prominent. You don't have to be prominent. Do you understand? You know, would you ever stop and think about this? Again, you know, baseball. Uh, I'm not a baseball fan. Uh, I would watch a baseball game if I was suffering from ins insomnia. Um, but tell me if this isn't true. If a guy's batting 300, isn't that a good batting average? Okay, tell me, isn't this how that's defined? If he's batting 300, that means in a thousand times at bat, he's hit the ball 300 times. And that's really good. Let me ask you another question. Would you let somebody do open heart surgery on you with that kind of a record? I mean, you know, you're all tensed up. You're going to have open heart surgery. The doctor comes in and says, uh, Ms. So-and-so, I'm here to do surgery. You ever done this before? <laughs> 999 times. Well, man, you know, you've done this a lot. Yeah. How's it going? Well, 699 of them died. I mean, would you, 300 times, I've done this 1,000 times, 300 times I succeeded. Would you let that guy cut your head or your heart? Not on your life. And we make that a good we make that good for a, for a baseball player. You wouldn't take that from a heart surgeon or a brain surgeon or any other kind of a surgeon you have. So you know what he'd say? He'd say, I wasn't a star. But boy, he gave us that book of Matthew, and it tells us some great things. The third thing he'd tell us, and you need to remember this, he'd tell us your greatest achievement may be what you leave behind. 
you understand you're not dead? And that when you're dead, you're not dead? Oh, yeah, I know, I'll be awake. No, 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 I mean that, that the life you live now will go on. I'm talking about people who knew you will know something about you. And your testimony will carry on. Uh, we, the, the books that are down there uh, on the book table that I did not write are the ones that my company publishes. We publish for about 20, uh, 22, 24 <clears throat> other authors. And we have two books down there that I am so glad we publish. I am so glad. Uh, one of them, uh, they're both written by ex-military. The one was a Marine. The other guy was in the Army. Both of them are Vietnam vets. Uh, one of them is called uh, Old Paths Preaching Methods. And that fellow was in the Marines in the, in the uh, siege of Khe Sanh in Vietnam. And after he got out of there, he got saved. And uh, he got cancer, probably Agent Orange, but he got cancer. At age 55, he died. Uh, and he's in heaven. All he ever wanted to do is serve God. The other one is called The Fight for Light. Uh, and that was by a guy who was actually a member of our church uh, down in Treasure Valley. His name was Bob Murphy. And uh, Bob was in the army in uh, Vietnam as a lost man, got into intravenous drugs, uh, got hepatitis C, uh, got out of Vietnam, got saved, but his, his liver didn't get saved. And um, it destroyed his liver. He went to uh, Romania for years as a missionary, came back, had a liver transplant, and just really struggled, really struggled on for about two or three years after that. I think, I think within 60 days of us publishing his book, he was with the Lord. I love publishing those two books. You know why? Because those two guys... All they wanted to do with their lives is serve God. And those lives, their lives were cut short by, dot, by death. But we sell their book, so there's a chance that they could still get some rewards from what they left behind. I get preachers. There's a, in that Old Paths Preaching Methods, there is an uh, outline. I believe he's got an outline for a sermon from every book in the Bible. And I've had preachers come up and tell me it's a help. I've had people that have a, have a fight with uh, chronic illness I uh, have told me they read Brother Murphy's book, and it's a help. It's got a, good, uh, it's got a good chapter on the plan of salvation. And what I'm saying is that who knows that when we get on the other side, we find out somebody either got saved or, or they got called to preach or they, they decided to follow the Lord, and it's a decision they made 10 years after one of those guys died because they read their book, what they left behind. We had a lady in my church up in Auburn, New York, She's a Roman Catholic lady, and she was visiting our church. Uh, she was a young woman, and she was, uh, she was uh, going to, uh, we were Cayuga County. Uh, and she went to CCC, Cayuga County, uh, CCCC, Cayuga County Community College. There's four C's. And uh, she came to church, came to church, never fought the Holy Spirit, never came forward, never got saved. Uh, and she came for about four months, and she was taking this English literature class, in this uh, secular college, and I don't know if you know this, but the, the famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, that was preached by, by uh, Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards came over here in the 1700s to be a missionary to the Indians, died because the, 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 the conditions living with there were, were so bad. He died a young man, but he preached a message called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Believe it or not, they say he read every word. They said he was a Calvinist. He was a very very monotone, uh, it, was not, uh, it was not emphatic, it was not uh, you know, bombastic, it was not dynamic, but he just got up and he's, and he's preaching, he's reading his sermon, and they said people were hanging on to the posts of the church screaming, don't let the devil take me, and there was a massive uh, revival, 150 people got saved that night, and the revival spread from that, from that sermon, and then Jonathan Edwards died. And I can't say that they still do, but I believe they may, probably somewhere. But that is still studied for its literary value in secular schools. And so she's taking this class, and, and here's these lost people today being told by a lost college professor, read this sermon. So they read the sermon. And she came to church one Sunday, and she said, it was a, I still remember, she was coming home from class on Thursday. And that Thursday, her, her English lit professor dissected that liter literally to show how good it was. And he kept saying, now we know nothing that he said. 
and we know there was just a bunch of religious fanaticism, but I just want to show you what a great job it was of presentation, because that's what they're trying to say. They're trying to say his presentation is what caused all the effect. And she said, as he said this, as he said, there was no power here and it wasn't anything spiritual, she said, I'm sitting there going, no, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. And she said, I got in my car, just got off the property, and the Holy Spirit got in the car beside her. She pulled off the side of the road, bowed her head, and trusted Jesus Christ, her personal Savior. She did that around 1984 or 85 from a sermon from 1700. Do you, you know, we don't know. They say 150 people got saved that night. We may find out way more than that got saved from that sermon for after his death to, to the Lord comes back. And what he, no matter what he achieved, gone to the Indians, we may find out that the greatest achievement was what he left behind. Do you understand? You know what Matthew left behind? Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew. Uh, it's the first book in the book of the New Testament. Man, God put it in a good place. It's a tough book to understand. But when you get it down, that thing opens up the entire Bible to you. It is, it is just, as you saw this morning, it is chapter by chapter. Every chapter is significant, even the genealogy. Every single chapter in that book. And when you get Matthew down, you, you can see you can see the changes that, that God made across time. You can see the changes that happened during the ministry of Jesus Christ. You can see where we are now and where they were then. And, and you know what? We may get on the other side and find out that the greatest things that Matthew ever did, he did through a book that got published after he died. book that uh, he, he wasn't there to see it, maybe. They say it was, uh, I got, uh, there's, a, there's an old uh, legend that Matthew was originally written in Hebrew. And um, what that comes from, there's three Greek manuscripts, minuscule manuscripts. They have a colophon, which is at the end. It's kind of like a, uh, uh, it's kind of, uh, it's not inspired writing. It's the scribe that wrote the manuscript. He's given a little bit of information. And there's a colophon that says that Matthew was originally written in Hebrew and translated into Greek. And it's found in three manuscripts because two of them are a copy of that one. So it only comes from one. And there's no, uh, there's no Hebrew copy of Matthew that's ever been found. And so that's not documented that his, uh, that his uh, gospel was written ever, ever written in Hebrew. Uh, if it was, then I guess that would make his Greek translation, inspired translation. That would really bother some people. But the fact is this. The greatest thing he did is what he left behind. Did you ever stop and think what the Bible says? The Bible says... That a, that a wise man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Now, let me ask you a question. First off, the day that you're married, you know what nobody's thinking about? How many grandchildren am I going to have? Because nobody knows. Right? Some people die before they're all, they're all born. But nobody, you know, we had three boys. And so we could say, okay, it, here's how we're going to divide our millions. Penny for you, penny for you, penny for you. But you know what I'm saying? If we had, an, if we had a, a, a hard figure on our great wealth, we could say, John gets this, Nate gets this, Luke gets this. And we didn't know how many grandchildren we'd have. So how do you divide your wealth to your grandchildren? And I was just talking to a, uh, I'm trying to think of who it was. It was a preacher friend of mine. And he was telling me how many, oh, no, it was my own sister. My own sister. She's got four great-grandchildren. I, but I always knew she was old. But um, <laughs> what I'm saying, all right, so how do you, how do you leave them anything? And you know, you know what you leave to your grandchildren? You don't leave money. I'll tell you how I got the answer to what a, what a grandfather or grandparent leaves to their grandchildren. Uh, probably about 10 years ago, I know he's dead now, but Rush Limbaugh was talking about his grandfather. And, and when Limbo talked about his grandfather, he said, my grandfather is 101 years old and still a practicing lawyer in, in Port Gerardo, Missouri. And then he said this, I attribute my conservative values. I got my conservative values from my grandfather. And I thought, that's what the grandparent leaves to the grandson or granddaughter. You can't leave them money. You know what you leave? You leave what you are. 
That's what you leave. And so, guys, if we all drop over, man, there's no telling what the story of your life will be for somebody. Um, through Gates of Splendor, the five missionaries who went to the Aka Indians in Ecuador, uh, one of them was Nate Saint. I preached back in the 1970s for his brother, Ben Saint. He had pastor a church in Ohio. And those five men died. And I will bet you that they did their, their lives, they, the, since they died, I'll bet you that from that time, they have gotten more influence on Christians from their death and since they died. And through the book, Through Gates of Splendor, than before they, got, before they died. So guys, you know what they say? It ain't over till it's over. And when it's over, it ain't over yet. Just because you're dead doesn't mean it's over. Your testimony will go on and on and on. And there are people that came to, to, to the funeral of Christians and got saved. And say, why? Because of the, the testimony of the Christian. So I think if Matthew was here, he would tell us no cost is too great. I, I think he'd tell us don't feel slighted because you're not the star. I think he'd tell you that your greatest achievement might be what you leave behind. And I think at the bottom line of this whole thing, you know what he'd say? It's worth it. It's all worth it. Oh, come on, Matt. You're a wealthy man. You're, you end up sleeping with a bunch of old fishermen who paid taxes to you and probably cursed you to your face. And you're sleeping on the ground. And there's people that did it. They almost stoned Jesus a couple times. You knew if they killed him, they'd kill you. You're telling me that was better? He'd say, I wouldn't go back tax collecting. Not if I could double the rate. I, it was all worth it. I am so glad I walked away from that. Let me remember, remember this, guys. You ever, you ever stop and think that just what the reminiscences must have been like? You think after the Lord passed on and, and uh, was crucified and rose again and, and passed on to heaven, uh, ascended back up to heaven. Do you think the apostles just ever kind of sat around and said, uh, you remember that night we were down by the sea? We just caught some fish. We just cooked them. And the crowds were gone. And we just asked him about his home. That's how we knew he came from heaven. When he described his home, we knew this could not be an earthly place. We, we heard his words. You know what John said? John said, he who our eyes have seen, who our ears have heard, who our, our hands have handled of the word of life, Man, they had a memory of Jesus Christ that you and I would never have. We have never seen him. We have never heard him. We have never touched him. Can you imagine what it must have been like for them just to talk about it was, what it was like? And let me just tell you this. Go to Matthew chapter 19. In Matthew chapter 19, the guy that wasn't a star... The guy that wasn't the first round, the guy that wasn't the close, uh, the chosen circle. Look what it says in verse 27. I told you, this is Peter, and if it's in his brain, it comes out of his mouth. And I wouldn't doubt all of them were wondering this, but in verse 27 it says this. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we are forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in, in the throne of his glory, he also shall sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Though he wasn't a star when he was down here as the apostle, he still gets one of the thrones. There's going to be twelve thrones. Matt isn't going to wonder about that. I mean, if the Lord said, hey, I need some guys to go with me, probably after a while Matt said, it won't be me. It'd probably be Pete or James or John. Those are the three he always grabs. Uh, Peter, James, John, you come with me. That's what I thought. But when he shows up here, there's going to be a throne for Matthew. He's still getting a throne. Do you understand? You know what the Bible says? Every person in this room has the opportunity to reign with Jesus Christ. All right, your pastor is a pastor. Uh, I travel around the world as, a, as an evangelist. Uh, there have been some great men of God uh, in, in the past, and you say, well, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not one of them. Yeah, but you still have the chance to reign with him. There's not one Christian in this room who doesn't have the opportunity to have your own throne to reign with him. You know what he's telling you? I'm telling you, you, wanna, you know what you want to do? You want to live so when this thing is over, 
you say it was worth it all. And I think this, I think at the end of this, hey, what do you think people said to Matthew after he walked away from that table? They probably said the same things they said to Bobby Bonner and, and, and Billy Sunday. You're walking away from, you're walking away from financial security. You're walking away from wealth. You're walking away from possessions. You're walking away from something that you could have all of your life. Are you crazy? You're following this nutcase carpenter's son and a bunch of fishermen. Those drunken fishermen, they tear the town up every time they get drunk. And you're going to run around with those guys now? Those guys cursed you and they paid you as your tax collector. Now you're hanging around with them. You know what he'd say? Man, that moment, that one pregnant moment when he said, follow me, and for a fleeting second I could say yes or no, flip of the switch, go or stay, I'm so glad I flipped that switch and said, I am going. Yeah. Yeah, I'd do it all again. I'd walk away from it. I'd leave it all behind. I'd, I'd watch him pick up the stones, getting ready to kill him and kill us. I, they say he died a, a died a martyr's death. But he'd tell me it was all worth it. What do they say? It's, a, it's an old, well-used line. Only one life soon will be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And guys, if we serve the Lord... One of these days it's going to be over. But just because you die doesn't mean it'll be over. That doesn't mean your influence, doesn't mean that your chance to reign, doesn't mean that your, your influence over people because your testimony will live on. Everything you leave behind will live on. Is that not true? And so, guys, you, you talk about, uh, your pastor talk about reading the Bible. Every now and then I get, I get phone calls. I met a guy from Alaska. He came down to our church and he said, uh, 20 years ago, he said, I never heard you preach, but he said, I heard a sermon about reading the Bible. And he said, I've been reading my Bible ever, through over and over ever since then. He said, I got a call from a guy. Uh, he was in a church, and I was talking about reading the Bible, and he said, I just called to let you know I finished my 30th time through the Bible. And if I drop dead today, those messages are still out there. I'm telling you guys, just because you die, your influence isn't over. It isn't over until the Lord takes us out of here. You understand? And we all have the chance to reign. So you know what I think he'd say? He'd say, man, if I could go back, they say, hey, Matt, if you could go back, you're in the town center, table full of money, people coming up and paying you, you see him over there coming across the square, you know he's about to look your way, you know he's going to come over and say, follow me. Would you just say, excuse me, guys, uh, I have to go back here for a minute. He said, no, man. He said, I'd stand there at attention. I'd have my eyes drilled on him. And when he turned around, those eyes fixed on mine. When he, I knew what he was going to want. I'd say, I am ready to go. Let's go right now. He'd tell you it's worth it. I'm going to tell you something. A life lived for Christ is worth it. A life lived for money is not. A life lived for fame is not. If, if fame and money are worth it, why are those people in Hollywood killing themselves? If that's what gives you happiness... How come they're on four and five and six different marriages? Because that's not the answer, guys. And so it's not a life of wealth, and it's not a life of fame, and it's not a life of, oh, I get to do this, and I'm going to fulfill the things in my bucket list. It's simply say, I'll follow you, and follow him. And when it's all over, we'll find out how it all sorts out. And wouldn't it be nice to walk up and see a throne? Oh, who's that? No, he's sat in that one yet. You walk up and go, that's my name. That's my throne. How would I get that? The Lord says, that's what we're going to talk about right now. So, guys, it is worth it. It's worth it to put out the tracks. It's worth it to be ostracized. It's worth it to be mocked. It's worth it to be laughed at. It's worth it to, be, to not fit in. Do you understand? It is worth it to walk away from anything for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when this whole thing is over, Matt, you know what he's going to say to some of, some of the Christians? I told you. <laughs> I told you. I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed.